Light is a physical phenomenon that we can partially perceive with our natural senses, which allows us to have a very intuitive representation of it. As an example, we can visualize very well what is a shadow projected on an object. But when we operate a change of scale, where the celestial bodies of the solar system begin to project shadows on our own planet, physics begin to reveal some fascinating aspects of the very nature of light. And to understand that, we need to go back a few years ago. Our story begins here, at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona in the United States. As its name suggests, this observatory was created by Percival Lowell in 1984, who spent a large part of his wealth on it. Just like me, their shop is amazing. Lowell wanted first and foremost to observe Mars, on which astronomers at this time were convinced to have observed the river beds on its surface through their telescopes. Quickly though, astronomers of the observatory went on a quest to find a hypothetical planet 9 in the solar system. And it's by using this instrument that a young astronomer, Clyde Tombow, finally discovered Pluto in 1930. They didn't seek this ninth planet randomly in the sky, they had studied Uranus and Neptune orbits to see if they were not disturbed gravitationally by another body. It's this kind of calculation that allowed the discovery of Neptune, so the method was already known to be effective. And indeed, after some calculations, they targeted a region of the sky where they thought to find the ninth planet responsible for small inconsistencies in the movement of Uranus and Neptune, and in just a few months, bingo, the planet was found. By regularly making photographs of the same region of the sky and spending whole nights looking for something that moves in relation to the background stars, Clyde Tombow found Pluto. For the record, it will take another 60 years before Voyager 2 flies over Neptune to measure exactly the mass of the planet, and we now understand that the calculations made at the time to find Pluto were based on bad assumptions on the mass of Neptune, and so the calculations were completely wrong. In fact, the movements of Uranus and Neptune were exactly as one would expect if one had known the true mass of Neptune, without any measurable irregularity at the time. But how did we find Pluto at the expected place in the sky then? Nowadays, astronomers all agree, it was sheer luck. Yes, just a coincidence, Pluto was at the right place at the right time. 40 years after its discovery, the Voyager program initially planned to explore this planet, but this was not to be. By prioritizing a flyby over Titan, Voyager 1 was forced away from the trajectory that would have allowed to visit Pluto. It would then require the perseverance of several teams for more than 20 years before a mission dedicated to Pluto is finally selected. It will be the New Horizons mission, a small probe of only 140 kilograms that was launched in 2006 and finally flew over Pluto back in 2015. We didn't wait for New Horizons to study Pluto, because we were already able to study a lot of things about Pluto from our own planet. I will pass over the most obvious ones, like the optical observation which made it possible to discover its moon Charon, which shifted the center of mass of the Pluto-Charon system above the surface of Pluto. Or the spectroscopic study that detected nitrogen ice on the surface of Pluto. Nature sometimes does things well, and scientists know how to take advantage of the fact that sometimes they just have to bend over or to look up to get precious tools to study the world. In particular, they have a very powerful tool that allows them to observe the planets illuminated not by our sun, but from the back. Star occultations. I believe all of you will already have seen pictures of star occultations. Indeed, solar eclipses are the best known form of star occultation, when the moon hides the sun, the star closest to the earth. It's also a type of occultation that's still used for scientific purpose today. There was of course the eclipse of 1919 that proved Einstein's relativity, or the one in 1973 observed for more than an hour on the Concorde, which was following its shadow at Mach 2, but even today the eclipse helps science. For example, the study of the solar corona can be done with large instruments in unique conditions, but also the diameter of the sun can be accurately known by measuring at what time the highest layer of the photosphere of the sun will be hidden between mountains and valleys of the lunar limb. Anyway, let's return to Pluto and occultations. Pluto has a tiny angular diameter, thousands of times smaller than the one of the moon. But be careful here, we are not traveling to the stars, we are only zooming toward Pluto from the Earth's surface. Despite its small apparent size, it happens that from time to time at night, this little planet passes in front of a star of the sky, and therefore projects a very weak shadow on the surface of our planet. The principle of occultation is simple in appearance. We have a star, we have a planet, 
Then the planet casts its shadow on the Earth. It's like a solar eclipse, but much less impressive since it's not the Sun that projects its shadow, but a weak star that is not usually visible to the naked eye. Thank you, end of the story. No, in fact, it's more complicated and moreover more interesting than that. So, how does the star occultation work? In our solar system, with some rare exceptions, all bodies orbit around the Sun. And if we add to that that the Earth rotates on itself, everything seems to move permanently in the sky from our perspective, which could make you feel a bit dizzy. For an occultation to be visible from a place on Earth, the shadow created by Pluto must travel through the entire solar system at light speed, which takes about 5 hours and a half. And at the end of the journey of this shadow, the Earth is placed in the right place during its orbit around the Sun. A mind-blowing delayed cosmic rendezvous, since at no time the star, Earth and Pluto have been aligned. In fact, the Earth must find itself at the place that was aligned with Pluto and the star 5 hours and a half earlier. This is one of the consequences of having a non-infinite speed of light. And only then, if the weather is nice, then we can see the brightness of the star which will decrease passing behind Pluto, then re-increase by reappearing. Well, in the illustration that I'm showing you, if Pluto seems black to you, it's not because it's dark. It's because I chose a star with a much brighter apparent magnitude than Pluto, and therefore the dwarf planet that is illuminated by the Sun seems very dark in comparison, in the same way that the Moon appears black during a solar eclipse while it's illuminated by Earth light, as can be seen here with a long exposure picture. Since we can measure precisely the speed of Pluto's movement relative to the Earth's ground, then if we stop the duration of this occultation, we can deduce the size of Pluto, even without needing a giant telescope powerful enough to resolve it. Awesome, right? An amateur astronomer with a telescope in his garden can measure the size of Pluto with a simple stopwatch. By making some literature research about Pluto's occultations, I quickly find thousands of results, and one name recurs very often. Larry Wasserman. He might be full of knowledge about Pluto's occultation. He's working at the Lowell's Observatory, the one in which Pluto was discovered. And I went there with my mic and my camera at the time he was available for a little chat. Pretty cool coincidence. My name is Larry Wasserman. I'm an astronomer at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. I was involved in the prediction of the Pluto occultation in 1988. <clears throat> we thought we were going to measure Pluto's radius at the time, but we were surprised to discover that it has an atmosphere. And when, you, when, when a, an object with an atmosphere occults a star, instead of the star disappearing abruptly behind the, yes, the object and then reappearing very quickly, so you get a square light curve, uh, if an object has an atmosphere, it rolls off more gradually and then comes back. And we were kind of surprised to discover that Pluto showed an atmosphere rather than a, uh, an airless body. Science is always surprising. When we study something, sometimes we have the opportunity to discover completely other things than what we were looking for initially. And these other things are sometimes way more interesting than the original purpose of the research. And while they weren't really knowing if Pluto had an atmosphere, they had a great surprise to discover in real time the gradual decline of the star's light occulted by Pluto. It's So, when the star of a light decreases gradually when it disappears behind a body, it means that this body has an atmosphere. Hmm, interesting, but can we go further by analyzing this light curve? The rate of the fall off, the way it falls off, is a measure of the temperature and pressure structure of the atmosphere. So it's, it's equivalent to sticking a thermometer into Pluto's atmosphere <laughs> with a small telescope on the Earth. And it's the only way to do it except for going there, which of course has happened once, New Horizons went there, but it only got one measurement. Yeah. And we've seen changes in pressure over time and I was just reading a paper by one of my colleagues who is suggesting that the pressure of the Plutonian atmosphere is a function of the uh, solar cycle. Uh, yeah. And when the sun is more active, the pressure goes up and the hazes go up. And is there a relationship with the sun Pluto's distance? Well, it cools off as it gets further away. And some people have said that they thought the 
atmosphere might freeze out yeah. when Pluto got far enough away. But it looks like from the occultation measurements that it probably won't, that it may get less dense, but it won't just freeze out altogether. It won't, it's still, it basically, the theory was that it would just form snow and settle to the surface. Okay. And we don't think that's going to happen now. Okay, indeed. We can learn a huge quantity of very precise data on the climate or even the local weather of a planet only from a single decreasing light curve. But we can therefore ask ourselves, why a star's brightness decreases when it's passing behind an atmosphere? We could first think that it's because of the light's absorption by the atmosphere. But actually, the reason is the atmospheric refraction that inclines the light path towards different directions. Since the atmosphere has a pressure increasingly higher as we get closer to the ground, the rays which cross it go through different refractive indices, and so will be more and more deviated. So when a star is visible through an atmosphere, we see it fainter than if there wasn't any, because its rays are deviated. But the corollary is, when it should be hidden behind the planet, we still can see it, because there will be a part of the atmosphere that will deflect some of the rays with the exact good angle towards the Earth. You can observe this phenomenon by yourself on Earth by looking at mirages or a moonset or sunset. For example, this day I could see the sun but the calculations were clear. In reality, it was already under the horizon, but I did see it because a part of its light has been deflected by the atmosphere and oriented towards my eyes. If a friend of mine taller than me looked at this sunset with me, he would see it too, but the image that he would see would have gone through another layer of the atmosphere and would have been deflected with a slightly different angle towards his eyes. This day, at the moment it disappeared, the sun was already in fact under the horizon for more than a minute. This refractive phenomenon is also what is responsible for the arc of light that we see around Venus when it passes in front of the sun. Its upper atmosphere, between 70 and 110 km high, is translucent and deflects partially the light passing through it. So the refraction can deviate the sun rays that pass through the Earth or Venus atmosphere, but it can also deviate the light of stars that would pass behind the atmospheres of Titan or the giant planets. And in this case, like on Earth, the star will seem to become orange, then red the more and more it sinks behind their thick atmospheres. Similarly, our moon appears more or less red when it is submerged in the Earth's shadow, that is during a lunar eclipse, depending on the quantity of dust present this day in the Earth's atmosphere, it will absorb more or less certain colors before deviating them towards the moon. And thus, in the same way, when we analyze the Earth's upper atmosphere composition by looking the brightness and the color of the moon during eclipses, on a scale that we call the dungeon scale, we can analyze the composition of another planet's atmosphere by observing how the star passing behind it has its color changed. However, in the Pluto's or Triton's case, the atmosphere are too tenuous and too clean to significantly modify their colors. Since Pluto is more or less spherical, there are in fact two main spots in the atmosphere where the light is deflected in our direction. They are located in the plane crossing Pluto's center, the star and Earth, as you can see on this representation, which is obviously not to scale. The plane, here in yellow, that passes through the planet is the one where the light will be the most deflected in the direction of an Earth observer. The starlight circulated by Pluto will be more visible where this plane crosses Pluto's limb, mainly along the two directions shown here. These two points do not deflect light the same way. The closest to the limb will receive more light than the other who needs more bending of the light. But you will notice that this strange phenomenon makes a star passing behind Pluto more visible in two opposite directions around the planet with so-called primary and secondary images. Further to this representation, I will now show you a simulation I've programmed that will give you a better idea of what your eyes would see through a giant telescope during such an occultation. I begin with an exaggerated setting, where Pluto's atmosphere is more extended than in reality, and what will pass behind is not a star, but Descartes' giant's portrait located light years away, as a tribute to one of the fathers of the refraction phenomenon study. As it passes behind it, we can see that the face is distorted and, as expected, have primary and secondary images as well as no blind spot. You can see all the painting, even the parts right behind it, like you can see a star hiding back. Following this physics but exaggerated simulation, I will now show you what a small white spot occultation would look like with the best settings I could find on Pluto's actual atmosphere that come from scientific publications, linked in the description. 
Given what we saw earlier, we can understand why a star loses light intensity when passing behind the planet, and why it stays visible due to light bending. As you can see, the closer to the center the star is, the more visible the secondary image will be on the opposite sides of the star. Which makes sense, because when Getir near to the center, the star is also approaching to the limb opposite to its position. You may also notice that because the secondary image light needs more bending to reach Earth, it appears lower in Pluto's atmosphere. There are some rare and unique observations of such phenomenon, like here, on these incredible images of a star occultation by the satellite Titan, which also has an atmosphere. You can clearly see, in the high atmosphere of this Saturn satellite, the primary image of the first star passing away from the center, and the primary and secondary images of the second star passing close to the center. These shots are unique. What I find crazy by looking at real light curves of an occultation by Pluto are the little variations of intensity during the occultation, which are mainly due to the fact that the primary and secondary images pass close to Pluto's limb, and can disappear for brief moments behind Plutonian mountains located on the limb, from an Earth point of view. Just by looking how the global intensity varies during the occultation, we can guess the presence of haze, clouds and mountains. Presence, in fact, confirmed by the passage of New Horizons probe. The scientists already knew what to expect regarding the haze observed. And like Larry said, it also gives information about temperature as the refractive index of an atmosphere depends on its temperature over molar mass ratio. By looking at the colors of the star's light that are observed by the atmosphere, we can induce its composition and thus its molar mass. And by looking at how the star's light decreases when passing behind the atmosphere, we are directly measuring Pluto's atmosphere temperatures depending on the altitude. For example, by monitoring this curve, they noticed there was like a drop in brightness. They deduced that the temperature of Pluto's atmosphere was almost constant during dozens of kilometers, and that the drop was coming from a colder atmosphere, when getting lower in altitude, or maybe from haze layers. We are also capable to induce the pressure depending on the altitude, with, in Pluto's case, a precision of a microbar, or 15 micro psi, equivalent to a millionth of Earth's atmospheric pressure. With your own telescope, you have a barometer that can measure the atmospheric pressure of Pluto with a greater precision than almost any professional barometer could do with our own atmosphere. And what's more incredible is that we can guess it just by looking at a blurry pixel, even without discerning the planet itself. And yet, you didn't see the most surprising phenomenon during an occultation by a planet with an atmosphere, that is... As the star passes behind the object, if it passes through the... if it, you see it pass through the middle, then the light is essentially focused by the atmosphere all the way around like a lens, and you get a point on the Earth where there's a brightening. You've heard it right, there is a flash when the star is right behind the body. Since the beginning, I'm talking about stars that pass close to the center, avoiding the case where it's right in the center. But you guessed it, when it passes through the center, it gets awesome. To find out more about it, I went to the Observatory of Paris, where I met Bruno Sicardi, an expert on this subject. Alors, le flash central, c'est un phénomène qui est lié à la déviation donc, des rayons lumineux par réfraction. Donc, les rayons lumineux qui rendent l'atmosphère de Titan, par exemple, sont déviés. Et euh, si on est dans l'axe euh, qui relie l'étoile à Titan, donc l'observateur est aligné avec euh, Titan et l'étoile, à ce moment-là, les rayons lumineux euh, de l'atmosphère euh, convergent vers un point qui est au centre de l'ombre. Et un observateur qui passe dans cette zone, qui est assez petite en fait, petite voulant dire une centaine de kilomètres de diamètre, voit tout d'un coup euh, le, tout le lame, tout le pourtour de la planète, du satellite s'illuminer. Donc il y a un anneau lumineux qui apparaît avec un flux lumineux qui augmente brutalement. Et euh, la structure de ce flux lumineux, la courbe de lumière, enseigne sur la forme très précise de l'atmosphère, et si cette forme n'est pas circulaire, comme dans le cas de Titan, on voit que l'atmosphère a une forme irrégulière, et cette forme irrégulière est elle-même causée par des vents 
qui déforme l'atmosphère. Donc c'est une manière de retrouver une vitesse de vent qu'il est difficile d'avoir par ailleurs, si ce n'est par des sondes spatiales. Ok, let's resume. For each altitude of Pluto's atmosphere correspond a refractive index of the air, and thus a bending of light rays. By moving to the center of the shadow, the primary and secondary images will merge, and a layer of the atmosphere will light up all around the planet. The further we are from the planet, the higher this layer of the atmosphere will be as light rays will need less deviation, and the closer we are, the lower will be this layer. To illustrate this, I have recreated the central flash in my living room. I've made Pluto, it's this cardboard disc, and I gave it a portion of atmosphere, it's the edge of the magnifying glass that will refract the light in one direction. And the light is this punctual source representing a star. If I wanted to represent the entire atmosphere and not just a portion, I would need a magnifying lens with a variable focus, and I couldn't get my hand on such a rare lens. We notice that for this portion of atmosphere corresponding to a certain altitude, light rays only converge to one point. And when our eye is getting closer to this point, and we are looking at my cardboard planet, we see that the atmospheric layer suddenly shines, and that the intensity of its flash is affected by the lens defects, the tape I put, etc. Even without the physical equations, we can feel that with such a light measure, many things can be studied in the atmosphere. Let's have a look at real images of central flashes now, like this one, created by the atmosphere of Triton, a satellite of Neptune. The amount of light measured from the star when it is hidden behind Triton is greater than if it was not. The atmosphere acts as a giant telescope that amplifies the brightness of the star. Many other bodies from the solar system have been studied this way. For instance, the first flash ever seen was in 1976 with an occultation by Mars, but others were seen around Saturn or Neptune. The measurement of these light curves during those flashes, as Bruno said, allowed determining an incredible number of parameters, such as the temperature, the speed and direction of the wind, the thickness of the clouds, etc. To show you a specific and illustrated example, the shape of this central flash indicates the flattening of the planet, or rather of its atmosphere. To understand this, you have to remember that each layer of atmosphere refracts light perpendicular to the ground. If the planet was a sphere, all the rays would be concentrated in the center where you would have a powerful but tiny flash. Now, look what happens when you flatten the planet a bit. The central flash looks like a diamond, which is a few dozens or hundreds of kilometers when it reaches the Earth. As you can see, the size of this diamond-shaped flash zone is greater as the planet is flattened. And by putting several telescopes that will meet the trajectory of the flash, we will be able to deduce its diamond shape, and therefore the flattening of the planet. And I remind you, all this while watching a single point of light that shines more or less over time. And so, with these flashes, small telescopes in gardens can provide regularly more precise and more global data than with space probes that are nevertheless on the spot. As for the central flashes, you can ask, when the moon passes in the middle of the shadow of the Earth during a lunar eclipse, why don't you see a bright spot in the center of this shadow? Because if that's correct, if you were on the moon in the center of the shadow, the sun that would be right behind the Earth should seem to shine all around the Earth through its atmosphere in a big flash, shouldn't it? Pour la Terre, en fait, euh, la Terre à Lune, il y a un peu moins de 400 000 km. Donc mais la réfraction est plus forte que sur Pluton parce que l'atmosphère terrestre est, est plus dense. Mais même comme cela, euh, les rayons lumineux n'ont pas le temps, n'ont pas la distance suffisante pour converger. Donc il euh, n'y a pas de flash observé pour la Terre simplement parce que la distance Terre-Lune est trop proche. Bon, idem si on rapprochait la Terre de, de Pluton, Et à un moment donné, on n'observerait plus de flash simplement parce que les rayons n'ont pas de distance suffisante pour converger. C'est qu'on a observé un flash central depuis la Nouvelle-Zélande en 2015. La hauteur du flash est moins grande que ce qui est attendu avec une atmosphère claire. Donc soit il y a de la brume, et ça on ne croit pas trop. Par contre, il se peut qu'une partie de la lumière à l'étoile ait été absorbée par des montagnes puisque les rayons qui causent le flash central passent à quelques kilomètres au-dessus de la surface. Et passant quelques kilomètres, il suffit qu'il y ait une montagne de 3 ou 4 kilomètres 
comme ce qui a été observé par New Reason, c'est que cette, ces montagnes empêchent le flash central finalement d'arriver. Donc ça veut dire qu'après 4 milliards et demi de kilomètres, on est juste à la distance où si euh, la pression était un peu plus faible, on n'aurait plus du tout de flash central. Donc on est juste à la limite et il se peut qu'une partie du flash ait été supprimée, mais donc est moins grand que ce qu'on pense, simplement parce qu'une partie a été bloquée par des reliefs à la surface de Pluton. After all this, you could say that the occultation of a star by a body without atmosphere must be very boring in comparison. Well, in fact, it's the other way around, and on the contrary, physics seems to go completely crazy in these cases. With an airless body, there is no atmosphere to deflect the light, and so you should expect the shadow to look like this. You see the star, you no longer see the star, and you see the star again. And if you look at the time remaining on this video, there you can think that no, it's really weirder than that. Photons are not small balls that follow their path straight, even if in your daily life you might think so. The light behaves in part like a wave, and waves have this amazing property of being able to get around obstacles, it's called diffraction. That's why, when there is an obstacle close to the trajectory of a group of photons, it's enough to deviate them from their path. That's also this phenomenon that makes that there are waves behind this concrete wall placed in the sea. Ou encore, c'est pour ça que là vous pouvez m'entendre alors que je vous parle depuis derrière ce mur. Pourtant, vous êtes dans l'ombre de ce mur vis-à-vis -vis de ma voix. En fait, les ondes de pression de ma voix se font diffracter ici et sont en partie déviées vers la caméra et son micro. Then, obviously, the light, the sound and the waves in the water are phenomena of very different natures and their waves are not diffracted the same way. As for the visible light, and unlike the sound for example, you don't have much opportunity to perceive its diffraction in your daily life, and that's because it's not the same scale, the wavelength of light to which your eyes are sensitive are about 1 million times smaller than the wavelength of my voice, which are on the order of magnitude of a meter. And the longer the wavelength, the bigger is the diffraction when the obstacle is large. For the light, it becomes possible to perceive this diffraction with your eyes if the obstacles to be circumvented are very small from the order of magnitude of the light's wavelength. Or if they are very far away, and here you may see the link with the subject that I'm talking about. For instance, here I mask the light with a screen that I call completely randomly the edge of the moon. And you think intuitively that it should end up with an illuminated part where it doesn't mask and a part in the darkness behind the mask. But in fact, it's not the case. The light is way more diffracted as it passes near the edge of the screen and it spreads partly inside the geometric shadow that would have been if the light was moving in a straight line. Do you see the diffraction figures here in the shadow of the moon? No, and that's normal. At this scale, diffraction patterns become negligible beyond a millimeter. And then my light source is not punctual, so there is a small area of penumbra that wipes off any diffraction pattern that could have appeared. My mask isn't perfect either, etc, etc. Ok, theoretically, if I had an infinitely small light source and a clear moon edge, between the shadow and the light it would have been a small transition zone where you would see diffraction patterns. I figure that with a laser and an optical lab it would be easy to see, but... Ok, let's go to a lab, check that. Pour comprendre ce qui se passe, on a donc créé un système solaire en miniature dans un laboratoire. Et pour ça, je vais être aidé par Renaud Matevé, bonjour. Bonjour. Tu es enseignant-chercheur et maître de conférence à l'université Paul Sabatier en optique et physique atomique. C'est bien ça. So we have here an artificial star, well, a laser. Here, the edge of the moon, which is in the light emitted by our artificial star. And over there, this wall, which represents the Earth and where is projected the transition between the shadow and the light of the edge of the moon. Ok, let's turn off the light and see what happens. Intuitively, we expect a nice shadow light transition, but instead, we see a diffraction shape resembling little waves. It is in fact difficult to precisely locate where the shadow's edge is. When a star disappears behind the edge of the moon, that diffraction pattern will be projected to Earth and move at roughly 1 km per second, which is the relative speed of the moon to the Earth. After some calculation, we find that for the visible light, while the distance between these waves is only several millimeters in the lab, it is around 10 meters when the shadow is cast from the moon. In other words, if we could freeze time at the moment a star disappears behind the moon, we would see faint light waves several meters apart around us. Well, if we had a light amplifier, of course. Have a look at the diagram showing this diffraction. Here we see in red the light curve if there was no diffraction. 
There are some spots where the star's light is locally amplified, so just before disappearing, the star will even appear sometimes brighter than if the moon was not right next to it in the sky, at least for a few milliseconds. What I'm showing you here is a theoretical figure for a monochromatic and infinitely small light source. Without caring about equations, if the light is white and the star is not a dot but a tiny disk in the sky, the light will vary differently just before fading, as seen here when I increase the apparent size of the star. So if we could measure those waves precisely, we would have a unique way to measure indirectly the apparent diameter of a star. And believe it or not, I found a scientist specialized in stars disappearing behind the moon, Andrea Rikiki. And yes, he succeeded in observing those diffraction patterns with the sensitive slow-mo camera, and deducted the apparent size of stars in the sky. Those slow motion pictures provided by Andrea I'm about to show you are unique and exclusive. And now the successive occultation of two stars from a binary stellar system. We just saw what the diffraction looks like when a gigantic object like the moon is occulting a star. But when an occultation occurs with a smaller object, things become even more interesting. Let's consider for instance the shadow cast by the small sphere. One could think that you would find these kind of waves all around the circular object's shadow. At first, at our scale, we obviously observe that the geometric shadow is mostly made of shadow of course, we can see that every day. Moreover, here, the ball is lit by the sun, so that when I move away from the wall, we see especially the edges that become blurred because of the penumbra induced by the apparent size of the sun. And that's enough to smooth any diffraction pattern. Now, I'm going to run a physical simulator that I coded for this video, in which the diffraction pattern generated by a perfect sphere that is the size of a football is calculated for different distances between the ball and the screen on which we see its shadow. This sphere is illuminated by a point source, and we will begin to move the ball away from the wall on which its shadow is projected. The red mark corresponds to the geometrical shadow of the ball. The interior would be black and the outside would be white if there was no diffraction, as you can see in your everyday life. The first thing you see is a very bright and tiny point in its center, which is called the Arago spot. If we don't see it every day, it's because of the same reasons as earlier. The light source is not perfect, the sphere is not perfectly spherical, etc. Even my physics simulator shows that if everything was perfect, this spot would be microscopic when the ball is few meters away. On the contrary, look at what happens when we take some distance. Some patterns start to appear around the shadow. Then, at one kilometer, even the inside of the shadow is filling up with light waves. By observing the ball's shadow further away, the pattern becomes even more exotic. Beyond a dozen or so kilometers, it becomes counterintuitive. The inside of the shadow is filling up with light, and outside, where we expect light, we find shaded areas. On top of that, no need for a perfect sphere anymore, even with a dented ball, that diffraction pattern is not going to change much. This example may seem pretty far from a real event, except in one case, a star occultation of course. With a quasi-punctual source and a shadowing object of several meters or kilometers wide, and located billions of kilometers away from us. Perfect for the light to reach the Earth nicely diffracted. To show you in the lab how far away small bodies would look like while passing in front of a star, let's go back to our test bench. Here again our laser mimicking a star, we upscaled its beam otherwise we would not see anything. Here our small planetary body. Those are tiny disks from 200 micrometers to 2 millimeters of diameter around which the light will pass. 
the light of the laser star is going to hit and go around the disc, it will be diffracted and we will be able to see its pattern on the wall. Closely looking at that shadow, we find without a doubt the Arago spot in its center and the concentric figures we were getting in my simulator. We can really see some light in the supposedly shadowed central area and shadowings all around it. By choosing a smaller asteroid, we get what we had before by moving the shadow further away. There is more and more light in the center and a large dark ring of shadow beyond the geometric shadow of the asteroid. Now let's take a look at a real case scenario. Let's assume this asteroid is about 3 km long and sits at 6 billion kilometers from Earth, beyond Pluto's orbit. If it passes in front of a star, its shadow will have this concentric ring shape, passing over at about 25 km per second or 56,000 miles per hour. Just look at the shadow going over Paris. If we are an observer on the ground, this diffraction pattern will fly by us in less than a second, and the star will look like it's twinkling, with a characteristic fingerprint depending on our distance to the shadow central line. To have an idea of what three observers would see in different locations around Paris, here are the light curves that would be visible at real speed while watching the occultation of that star. By analyzing this signature, we can estimate the size of the object, its distance, etc. By simply looking at a star twinkling in the sky, we could discover tiny asteroids that even the giant telescopes here on Earth could not see. At the Observatoire de Paris, I discussed the subject at length with François Europe, specialist on the star's occultations by small bodies. This is the kind of discussion we had. It was very interesting. What is remarkable with these occultations is that an object at the level of the nuage de Hort on détecte sur Terre avec un télescope relativement accessible un objet de 5 km ou 10 km. Il aura une signature dans, par occultation tout à fait détectable. C'est absolument des objets absolument inaccessibles par n'importe quelle autre méthode. Donc on n'a pas encore détecté, détecté d'objets du nuage d'or, mais c'est la seule méthode que l'on peut euh, envisager pour détecter des, des objets du nuage d'or, c'est les occultations. Alors oui, euh, plusieurs équipes dans le monde cherchent ces, ces phénomènes et donc en particulier il y a une équipe américaine qui a recherché ces profils dans les données du télescope spatial Hubble en utilisant les données de la caméra de guidage qui sont des données qui sont acquises à grande fréquence et donc la recherche a été faite dans ces données et donc deux profils de diffraction ont été obtenus dans, dans les données du télescope spatial avec l'avantage que c'est des données qui n'ont pas qui ne sont pas perturbés par l'atmosphère de la Terre. Quand on fait des observations de la Terre, on, voit, on a l'accentuation due à l'atmosphère de la Terre qui est quand même une imitation à ce type d'observation. Donc en fait, on a fait de la science avec un instrument qui n'était pas vraiment fait pour faire de la science. On détourne les données, des données de la caméra de guidage qui n'est pas, pas du tout destinée à faire de la science, elle est destinée à, à, au pointage du télescope. Et donc ces données ont été euh, déclassifiées, réutilisées pour faire de la science. That diffraction can generate other strange phenomena. For example, when a star is passing in an empty zone of Saturn's ring, its light will reach us directly since there's no obstacle. But the light that crosses the rings will be diffracted by the dust composing it and part of it will come towards us. Therefore, the star will appear much brighter than usual for a couple of seconds between those two rings and will later disappear for several minutes behind those same rings. This phenomenon explains why the semi-transparent part of the ring seems to glow when seen from the back. The light passing through them has been in fact diffracted by the particles composing it. Well, it's all very nice, but I still haven't explained the shadow that crossed America during the summer 2017. It's in the first seconds of this video. Let's resume our Pluto story where we left it. So, the probe finished its main mission, it visited Pluto. Now, what do we do with that probe? The easiest way to answer that question is to directly ask a scientist working on the next step of that mission. He works in Boulder, Colorado at the Southwest Research Institute. Hi, I'm Simon Porter. Um, I'm a research scientist here at the Southwest Research Institute and I'm a co-investigator on the New Horizons mission. After passing by Pluto, we had no fuel to stop, but we had a little bit of fuel on board to divert, and we knew that the spacecraft was going to fly through the densest part of the Kuiper belt, so that's the, the second asteroid belt that's beyond Pluto, it's beyond uh, Neptune. And these are objects that are pretty much where they formed when, when they originally started. Um, 
nothing's pretty much happened to them in the past four and a half billion years. They're, they're very old. Um, and it's unlike nearly every other object in the solar system. So they're really strange objects, never been to one. We really want to see what they are. Uh, we diverted the spacecraft to fly past one of them, 2014 MA69, and then we're going to look at a few more distantly as we go along. It's only been recently that we have star catalogs and we have telescopes that are high enough precision that we can start doing these occultations of, of small bodies, not just big planets, but small bodies like MA69. Oh wait, right, I need to stop for a moment to explain why star catalogs and large telescopes are essential to predict occultation by small bodies. When you want to be certain that a body passes in front of a star, you need to know the body's trajectory and the star position in the sky. Thanks to Gaia, a European satellite, we have today a good and precise knowledge of the star's positions. Despite this, it remains an uncertainty on the shadow trajectory over the Earth, and for that reason, they position several telescopes over dozens of kilometers north and south of the predicted shadow path. So we predicted some uncertainty for the first um, one in uh, June, and we went out to two and a half sigma on, on it, and didn't see anything. <laughs> anything? That we saw. Okay. <laughs> so it. It was there, and it, that's probably that there was a few bad points that just kind of pushed us down, because then, you know, we, we found out later that we should have been much further south. Ah, okay. Uh, but then between the June and the July ones, we had this light curve campaign where we had tons of orbits, so we knew exactly where we needed to be. Um, now, with the July 10, we were only doing with Sophia, so it's one aircraft, we put it in one place, and get what we get. Yeah. But for uh, the July 17, uh, we had uh, 24 telescopes. We had pretty high certainty we knew where, where to look. So we had a nice dense grid of, of telescopes that we could put down. We were able to get five separate occultations uh, with the object. It's a big advantage to have multiple observation locations for the same occultation. Remember earlier when I told you that with a simple stopwatch you could guess the size of the object? We clearly see here that observers on the red and green point will have different measurements. Therefore, we need several observers around the trajectory to have a good guess about the size and shape of the object. And so we had five different cords that blinked out and could give us some idea of the shape of the object. It's either very lumpy or it's two objects like one on top of each other. Uh, and we're not really sure if it's that, which one of those it's that. But, um, you know, it's it was clearly not just a a circle that got occulted there. It's some lumpy object that we need to work on to figure out what's going on. The study of those five cords is relatively easy because the object is 50 kilometers in diameter and so the diffraction is rather low. This is what its shadow roughly looks like, taking into account the diffraction. We can see that its edges are rather well defined. In addition, these occultations supported directly the planification of the flyby trajectory because one point in particular scared the engineers. The, the main science that we wanted to put to bed was to make sure that these objects did not have dense rings of material around them. And one of those occultations was of Shrinklo, um, which is a centaur, and it, it, was, it was discovered that it had a series of rings around it, which if you fly a spacecraft past Shrinklo, you don't want to fly through those rings because it's going to hit something. <laughs> So we wanted to make sure that MB69 didn't have dense rings like that, and it looks like it doesn't. So we can uh, put, you know, be reassured. Doesn't mean that there aren't, fi you know, faint, diffuse rings around there. That's what we have to do work on now is to make sure that there isn't there. But it, yeah, there aren't obvious dense material there. Stay tuned for uh, January first, twenty nineteen. Um, the main thing we discovered with this is that the the object is there, and that it is, we know it's going to be interesting, no matter what it looks like. We have no idea what it's going to look like besides the fact that it's lumpy, but uh, it's going to look cool. We can stop here the history of Pluto's exploration and New Horizons probe since the flyby of two thousand fourteen MU sixty nine or Ultima Thule will happen the first of January two thousand nineteen, and everything indicates that this cosmic encounter will be fascinating. So keep some champagne in the fridge after New Year's Eve to celebrate the visit of the furthest object ever by a human creation. 
while cameras will take pictures 6 billion kilometers away from you. Look up to the sky. Among all those twinkling stars, maybe one of them will cast the shadow of a large rock from the other side of the solar system. That's not impossible. Thanks to everyone who watched this long episode. I wanted to come up with some original and technical stuff, and I think we nailed it. For this freedom that I'm enjoying, I must thank each and every one of you who is supporting me on Patreon, without whom this channel would already have stopped. Just with all those interviews all around the world, it's the kind of episode that costs a lot to produce. But hopefully, all this time and money are worth it, and you find here a truly original content. I cannot recommend you to subscribe to my channel, as episodes are not coming out that often, unless you really appreciate the particular concept of this channel. See you soon everyone, with, well, something way different again. Bye bye.